I made a conscious decision to go upscale. And unbelievably, I got much, much better clients. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, you're listening to the Technology Equals Equality Podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Technology Equals Equality Podcast. I'm your host, Lori Brooks, and this is episode 67. If you don't have a paper and pen or some way to take notes during this episode, Press pause and we will be here when you return. Today, I'm hanging out with Mark Melling, entrepreneur, marketing consultant, and advanced thinker. Mark's expertise includes massive implementation skills to accomplish the result you want so desperately. Mark's don't be a victim attitude is born out of outrage from having been an advertising victim himself. Take Control Marketing staff, led by Mark, forensically finds untapped money sources in your business. Like a metal detector on illegal steroids, Take Control Marketing's proprietary climb interview finds hidden treasure overlooked or ignored by your team and turns them to your profit. Mark, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here, Lori. Thank you so much. Certainly. What we would love to know is a story of how it is you once saw the future long before you began thinking about an entrepreneurial journey. Think back to your childhood. What did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? You know, when you were talking to your parents and, you know, adults ask you all the time as you're growing up, what is it you want to be? What did you think that would be like? Uh, Well, I I had a very strong aviation background. And Mm. so... I very much intended something along that line, and uh, I've been in aviation for almost 40 years. So uh, it it actually occurred, not necessarily exactly as you picture it as a child, but uh, very much I've been involved in in small aviation, in military uh, aviation. I was a naval aviator, and uh, I continued on flying a private business jet for a Warren Buffett company. Mm-hmm. And during that time, I also uh, um, did marketing, and so I do a lot of marketing in the aviation niche, but I also do a lot of, uh, of general marketing, too, and it, it kind of all follows from that, but, but for me, the key that really got me into the entrepreneurship was uh, an incident where I was sitting in a class uh, in a new company I was working for. And the uh, guy sitting next to me, we became very good friends. And this was after my time in the Navy. So I was probably in my late 40s. And uh, he uh, he had a funny little shake in his wrist. And I had had a friend of mine who had had Parkinson's. Mm. And I kind of noted this. And I didn't know the gentleman well enough to really say anything about it. But about and he and I became good friends. And about uh, four years later, he called me up and says, Hey, Mark, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, and I realized, you know, um, what are you going to do? And he had no fallback plan. And so I realized I've got to have a fallback plan as a a pilot. Uh, You can lose your medical very quickly. But the other is this is around the same time that businesses are laying off. uh, You know, it just became very obvious that, got to start to stand up and take care of yourself sometimes. Mm -hmm. You can't be relying on everybody else. You you know what I mean, right, Lauren? Certainly, I totally do. It's very similar to my own journey, having been put on an unpaid medical leave when I was diagnosed with Crohn's. It's amusing. It's, you know, you can have your job back when you don't have a chronic illness. That's when I needed that fallback plan, so I completely understand, you know, in some ways I wish I had started much, much sooner, and I hear that from many, many entrepreneurs that I speak with. One of those things that they would go back and tell themselves if they had the opportunity was get ready sooner, start sooner, don't wait to that last minute, don't wait to the last second, create and have that backup plan in mind, you know, even if it's not necessarily in the works just yet. So You know, planning, planning your your thing, just doing the research, yep. first of all, it keeps you busy, it, you know, it gives you an alternative other than just drinking beer and watching TV, <laughs> which I don't object to, but uh, you can do too much. Uh, the idea is you can sit down and say, well, how would I do that? Even in your own job, you can say, gee, right. but if I were running the place, how would I do it? And you can start to build up a an entrepreneurship mentality. 
Yes. It helps you to look at things from a totally different perspective. Perspective is extremely important in life as a whole. Um, but when you're looking at the entrepreneurial journey, you know, one of the most recent guests that I had interviewed, Tanya Green of PMS Bites, we were talking um, about the perspective of how it is you go through this entrepreneurial journey and the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to be a solo situation that there's the entrepreneurial journey can look very different for different people you can you know she was mentioning spearheading some sort of project in your own organization taking the reins on something and having that be where you take that leadership drive what do you feel like were were some of the first steps that you took mark when you decided all right i've got to figure out what this fallback plan is going to be. Was that when you decided you were going to start doing the research? What, what do you feel like were some of the first steps you took there? Well, it, it, uh, I have to tell you, having been in marketing as long as I have, I constantly see different things. I go, oh, you know, that could be developed. I think that's something that may have some potential, some future. And I've, I've probably had eight or ten of those that I've seen. And so it was easier for me because I understood a lot of the background. I had already questioned myself saying, okay, what would you do? How would you do it? Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, okay, you can watch all the YouTube videos on tennis you like, but then you got to pick up a stinking racket and go out and do it. And that's a whole lot different. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, that's what happened is I decided, all right, let me find something that would fit my existing schedule and that was something I could do locally and wasn't necessarily internet dependent. And the only reason I, I say that, uh, that last point, is because I wanted something analog. Uh, everybody's jumping on the web, doing all this stuff, and I wanted something that was one on one with people. So, so that was basically uh, the route I took, and through an odd series of events, um, I found my first business. The, I'm going by a house, and here is a flood of water coming out the garage door and going down the driveway, and there's nobody home. And I know there's not been anybody there for a couple months because it's a snowbird. People who, you know, avoid the snow by yeah. coming down here to Florida. And then when they start to melt, as summer comes near, then they want to go scurrying back up the nice places like Boston. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, I'm looking and I'm going, what do you do? I mean, there's obviously water coming out of there. Just who do you call? Yeah. You know, what is, I mean, so I, I got a neighbor and I said, you know, do you have a key or anything? No, no. And so we ended up having to break a window in a garage access door and go in, and it turns out that the line to the water softener had broken. Oh, no. And the, the people had a sunken living room, except that it really was. Oh, no. Um, oh, yeah. We're talking eight, <laughs> eight inches of water in their, in their living room. And then when it rose up over the step, it worked its way out the garage and down the driveway. So we, we shut it off, but now the answer is, okay, how do we get a hold of them? And so, well, it ended up being like $25,000, $30,000 worth of damage. I mean, it's just a, and I realized, you know, there's got to be a market for yeah. somebody to take care of these properties. And that was the beginning of a company I founded called Home Watch Valet. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial uh, path. I'm, I'm actually going to have to bring it back just a bit because you said a lot of really great things there, Mark. And I, I kind of want to rewind to the point where you were uh, indicating um, it, once you stop consuming all of your uh, YouTube videos, you can start creating, you can start moving forward, you can start actually doing things. Um, and I think that's a really important piece to, to kind of pull out there. I've actually written a blog post on that because it's it's one of those big pieces. No matter how much you sit around and, and read about a topic until you begin taking action, you're never going to be able to get much further than that. I like the fact that you pulled out those three really important pieces for you, that it fit your schedule, that you had the right location, and that it wasn't web-based, that you really wanted to work one-on-one -on -one with people. And I think that's important for, for the audience to understand that you had a set of criteria that was important to you in terms of ever 
venturing into an entrepreneurial journey, not necessarily what industry did you want or, you know, the, the type of customer or client that you wanted to work with, but really what were the important pieces for you personally when you began that journey? And I love the way you define those. So you started the Home Watch Valet. What do you feel like was the hardest piece of actually getting that company off the ground, getting into the market? Do you feel like it was trying to find the right clients or do you feel like it was some sort of red tape in, in some other area? No, it was absolutely the uh, uh, finding the clients. So uh, more than anything else, I think every business struggles with the marketing. Yeah. And uh, for me, uh, I had to identify who the uh, you know best client profile really yeah. was. And uh, and I screwed it up. I screwed it up at the beginning big time. This is this is not one of those, hey, I walked in and uh, you know, three days later I sold it to Microsoft for a billion dollars. This isn't any story bad at all. This is a struggling, learning, falling down, getting dirty, standing up, brushing myself off, going another twenty steps and boom, right down on my face. Yeah. It uh, you know it it took a lot of effort. I was ahead of the demand in many respects, and uh, I, because I hadn't had the experience of actually running the company, um, it just it made for a number of different challenges. And I, I'll tell you the biggest one, but it's the one that turned my company around, and that is that I had I had used you know there's only like three types of pricing. Uh, one, is, one is basically a, a shot off the hip. I think I'll charge this much and see what happens. And then there's the, well, let's see what my competitors do and I'll kind of match it. And then there's, there's deliberate pricing where you say, all right, boom, I'm going to establish this pricing level. And so when I first got started, I was kind of doing what my competitors did. And there's, there's not that big a market yet. There wasn't. I, I was probably on the leading edge of this market of home watch. And so I'm getting, uh, you know, people with houses that aren't that impressive, um, who aren't taking good care of them, and I'm not making a lot of money, and I'm running around like crazy, and I'm charging at the top end of what everybody else is charging. And I did this for a year and a half and said, you know what, there's not enough money in this, and I almost shut it down. Mm. Instead, I made a conscious decision to go upscale. And I said, you know what? I am going to price myself in such a way that anybody with a million dollar plus home can afford it. But if people below that are going to go, oh, my like, oh, I don't want to pay that. So I tripled my prices. I mean, literally went from 50 bucks a month to 150 overnight. And unbelievably, I got much, much better clients. And the reason is because as I asked them as they came on board, I said, you know, what was it that attracted you to Home Watch Valet? Almost without exception, they said, we knew you must be good if you could charge 150 bucks a month. Yep. And so that was probably one of the biggest things. That totally changed everything. Once I did that, I now had, if you think about it, I only needed one third as many clients to make the money I was making. Yep. Because I charged three times the price. Well, that also gave me it gave me more time, but it gave me, you know, the opportunity to do little things that had big perceived value. Yes. So, you know, there's so much there that you can do when you've got a nice margin. Definitely. And so that was probably one of the biggest mistakes that I was lucky enough to get correct. I think I think most entrepreneurs go through that exact situation of the, the startup phase of trying to figure out, like you said, with the three types of pricing, the phases that you go through the, okay, this is what I'm going to charge. And then the, okay, well, that are other people doing. And then the, all right, this is realistically what I need to be charging. And this is why. Um, and really understanding that why, as well as the perceived reality that accompanies it, um, can make a huge difference in your ability to move forward. I love that you were able to, you know, literally triple your pricing overnight. And, and that phrase, um, like I said, you know, perceived reality is, is extremely important because across the board, um, no matter what industry we're referencing, that phrase is a, a, an extremely powerful one. The phrase of, we knew you must be good if you could charge X. 
Um, it, mm-hmm. it's, an, it's an important one. So I love that. What do you feel was really like the first step in creating that, you know, your revenue model once you decided, okay, I know that the, the pricing structure just literally is way above where I initially was. So like you said, you were at 50 bucks a month, you tripled it to the 150. What do you feel like was, was the first step of solidifying and moving forward from that point? Oh, that's, that's actually, believe it or not, that's an easy question. <laughs> and I guess, again, because of my marketing background, the right. answer is I had to ensure that the perceived value was there. Yes. The perceived value is the key to in, to justifying the price. And there are a number of things that I did, uh, some of which I'm going to say as if it took me two days, but it wasn't. But one of the first things I did was write a book. Mm-hmm. And you can still buy the book on Amazon. The book is called Leaving Your Home Alone. And it was written at the time when the Home Alone movie series was very active. And so it had a little bit of resonance. And it's actually a book on how to do it yourself. And you might think to yourself, well, that's kind of nuts. So why would you, you know, want people to do it themselves? And the answer is anybody who's going to do it themselves is not my client. Yeah. And so I can get my name out there. I can get the, you know, have the book. But I'll tell you, the fun of the book was I called it a $45 business card. And the reason is I charged $38 or $39 for the book. And it tells you all how to leave the house and what everything to do and et cetera. And I mean, it is chock full of things that I have yet to have anybody read it who doesn't say, gosh, I never knew that, that, and this. And so, but I would take this hardcover book and when somebody would call me and say, well, come on over and talk to me about this. And I would go over there and I would walk in and almost invariably and probably out half the time, it would be somebody who's a person of wealth and they would say, who are you to be managing my home? Mm -hmm. You know, tell tell me what's going on. And I would take the book and Mm -hmm. I would, I had timed it and practiced so it could go boom on the granite countertop. And I said, well, I am the guy who wrote the book. And that was instant credibility. And I believe that was one of the things that I have, I, I rarely have ever had somebody in person question my rights. Of course. <laughs> you wrote the book so, on it, Mark. But see, I, to suggest that this is something I alone can do right. at all. I, right. I'm saying this because anybody listening to this has the ability to do the same thing, to practice. Sometimes you need a consultant. That's what I do right. is I help people. You know, to to see this stuff, what makes you different, what differentiates you, and things like that. And sometimes it takes an outsider to do. I just happen to have been blessed and was able to see this kind of stuff and do it on my own. Now, we had a bunch of other things that we did, but it was all based on perceived value. Mm-hmm. And when they saw that difference, the, the price was never a question. The only time I had a problem is when somebody would call. And the first question would be, what's your price? And I learned, I had scripts, which I had used, which I recommend everybody use, because otherwise you get frustrated. Yeah. And always answer the same questions and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I, I would use a script that very simply said, um, is it possible that you're not familiar with the service? And so that's why you're asking about the price, because for a lot of people, they don't know how to, how to inquire and I'm more than willing to tell you because I'm afraid that if you just choose on price, you'll be very disappointed. Should we talk about that a little bit? And those who would say, well, yeah, tell me about that. Then we could talk and, and I'd explain and then we would get into the understanding of what made me different, et cetera, et cetera. For those people that would say, no, no, I just want the price. Well, that was easy. Just for grins and giggles and because I never wanted them to call back, I'd tell them it starts at 500 bucks a month. Yep. And basically, I knew that when they went out and got somebody for 50 bucks a month and had a problem, they would not be calling me back. Right. Because I didn't want to deal with those kind of people. Right. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. I love how you took two two major steps there. Um, and, and the third, which kind of, you know, isn't really clearly defined just yet, but 
your first step was ensuring that the perceived value was there. Once you increased that price and you wanted to keep that pricing structure, you made sure that the value that people were looking for existed. Then you created your own authority in the industry by establishing your own credibility with writing the book. And as I see, you are actively online answering questions via social media and making sure that people understand that you do understand and know what it is that you're referencing and dealing with and talking about and are capable of assisting them with solving issues that they have. And three was to really define that ideal person that you're looking to work with and you're looking to serve above all else. And once you have those three pieces singled out and clearly defined for yourself, it becomes a lot easier to move forward with the defined structures that you may create with the pricing. So that was excellent, Mark. Thank you for wrapping all of that up. No, it's, a, it's, it's it, you know, it's so easy to talk about here. Mm -hmm. As if, oh yeah, I just kind of woke up one day and said, well, I think I'll write a book. Right. There wasn't anything like that. The <laughs> answer is no. All that, that took me six months right. of hard work to write that book. Yep. And get it printed, and et cetera, et cetera. But nowadays, it's a whole lot easier. There's so many different ways to do it. Yes. And uh, so... You know, when I when I go and sit down and talk to clients and say, have you ever written a book? I mean, you and I could talk for another hour just on that because it's so easy to do. Right. And, and I'll, I'll give you a little secret that I'm doing right now. I think you already get my Tablet Marketing Academy, uh, my weekly uh, thing that, that talks about a section of marketing, just a small, you know, little tiny nugget of marketing once a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole purpose of that, I mean, yes, I'm, I post it on LinkedIn and I have a long list of people who, who get it. And, and if your readers want it, they're welcome to it too. It's, it's pure teaching. It's good stuff. But the purpose of it is think about this. I'm doing this once a week. At the end of 52 weeks, you think I'm going to have enough for a book? Hello. Right, right, right. exactly. No, that, that makes perfect sense, kind of sending out that newsletter piece that creates the content for the future content. Repurposing your material in different ways is not a bad thing. It's a useful thing because not everyone's going to see your material in all places. And if you want the information and the message to be shared, it makes the most sense to continue uh, repurposing information so that people can, can continue consuming it in, in different manners that are most suitable to them. Um, what have you learned throughout this journey, Mark? You were initially focused in the aviation world and marketing aviation at that. What do you feel like you've branched off from outside of marketing, outside of aviation? What do you feel is your unknown on this journey? Golly, that's pretty deep, you know. I, <laughs> hell of a cow. <laughs> Let me lay down on the sofa. <laughs> in, uh, in, in reality, what I have discovered, and I've known this for years, and that is the whole world is marketing. And the reason I say that is because marketing, a lot of people, you know, it sounds so complicated. It seems like, well, everything's marketing, and I don't know what marketing is. And it's very, very simple. It comes down to a simple phrase. And marketing is merely persuasion and influence. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Anything you do that fits into that category. In fact, you used to be in marketing. I bet you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> no, well aware, unfortunately. <laughs> well, okay, well see, but most of your most of your listeners now right. I'm not very good at doing psychic uh, <laughs> over the phone to the masses, but I'm guessing that probably all of them between the ages of ten and about fourteen had something they really, really wanted. Yes. Precisely. And so they thought about well, am I going to talk to mom or dad? And what am I going to do? And maybe I'll do it right after dinner, you mm -hmm. know, before they watch the news. Mm -hmm. And, man, I'm going to make this offer, and I'm going to promise I'm going to, like, do the dishes until I'm 57. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they made all these plans, which are, in fact, marketing. Yes. It, it's all those things. And so that's what I really came to realize, that that two-year-old, that's screaming for, you know, frosted <laughs> sugar crunchies is doing marketing. <laughs> so, so that has really shaped me because, in fact, when I, when I sold the home watch business and went entirely into marketing, that was the first thing I recognized is that's the weakness gotcha. in most businesses is their marketing. Yep.
Yep. No, definitely. I agree 100%. Um, marketing is, is one of those areas where unless you really begin to focus and study or really employ the assistance required to help you understand and fully kind of grasp how to position your own uh, practice, it's, it's a very difficult area. And you're right. Everything is marketing. Everyone has been a marketer at some point in their life. Uh, and I think there was even a book, the guy, um, I think it was Robert Ringer wrote a book. It was Nothing Happens Until Something Moves. Mm-hmm. And what he really meant is until something sells. Because there's, there's a great story, heck, and it took place right under your nose up there in Boston. <laughs> the, uh, the guy who started uh, the Boston Brewery, I believe is the name of it, when the gentleman who started that is a perfect example of an entrepreneur. He was working in a business, and his family had been in the beer world, and so he started this on the side. When he finally started to move into it full time, he's buying equipment and doing all this other stuff. And his uncle called him up and said, so what are you doing today? And he says, well, I'm going out to buy a new computer. And the guy says, why are you doing that? He says, well, you know, I need a computer that can keep up with everything. And his uncle said very clearly, "Uh, how much beer have you sold? And he says, "Uh, well, I don't have any sales yet. He says, you don't have a business yet. It's a hobby. Yes. You have to go get sales. And he actually went and put six beers in his little briefcase and went down to the local bar and was so ignorant, he walked in and started talking to the first guy who answered. Well, the first guy was the barkeep, the one who, who oh, no. talked to everything. And he says, well, let me get the owner. And the owner comes out, takes a drink, and says, that's good beer. I'll buy 20 cases. Nice. And he walked out with an order for 20 cases and realized, now he's now he's in business, right. I love that. I absolutely love that, and I did not know that story, so I'm going to have to check that out, and maybe I can reach out to him and have him on the show, so thank you for that. Do you have a favorite tip or a trick or a quote or, you know, a tool that you feel like really helped you throughout your journey? There really is, um, and I refer to it and teach it. I call it the golden triangle. Hmm. And it, it's fairly easy to comprehend. It's a, as you can imagine, it's a triangle of three elements. Each leg has a name, and the three names are the market, the message, and the media. And this triangle is not my own invention. I would credit uh, Dan Kennedy uh, with this. And I can, I can tell you that the reason I believe that is so key, and I beat that into my clients, uh, just all the time is because that has saved me so much money, hassle, and aggravation than anything else. And I'll give you the, the thumbnail sketch real quick. And that is before you spend a dime on any type of advertising, marketing, I don't care what it is, you've got to figure out your market, exactly who it is you want to go to, the message you want to convey to that market, which obviously needs to be the type of message that that will resonate with them. And then you need to find the media where they're hanging out so that, in fact, you can get their attention with that message and most likely get a sale. So the market, the message, and the media, and it has to be in that order. Too many times what's happened, and I was guilty of this, many times somebody walks into a new business because they found you through the Internet, through, you know, somebody calls the records of who got a business license, and somebody comes in with this magical media that you need to buy right now because it's going to bring so many people here. You're going to have to put up ropes and lines like a Disneyland, you know, and, and they get you all excited. It turns out they're really selling you a media. You don't know whether that's going to get to your market, and you haven't even determined what the message is. Mm -hmm. So people are spending money on that media, and that media could be social because most people don't think of social media as social media. And so it could be that. It could be any number of things. It could be a guy walks in and says, hey, we got newspaper ads here. Oh, everybody reads a newspaper. Well, 
no matter what it is. I, there was a time when yellow pages, oh my gosh, yellow pages, everybody's going to have yellow pages. You know, you, you, you don't advertise with us, nobody's ever going to find, you know, this kind of stuff. And the problem is that's the third step. And so I have found those, that element, the golden triangle of those three legs in that order has saved me more times than not. Here I am. I'm opened up the home watch business. I've got million dollar properties. Things are going real well. Guy calls me up. And this was after I'd already kind of learned my lesson by being burned with another one. Guy calls me up and says, hey, I got the best thing in the world for you. Oh, my gosh. We're going to put your name on shopping cart handles and your phone number. Everybody needs food, so everybody's going to see your name. It's going to be fabulous. You're going to have more people coming than you ever had before. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. When does it start? Oh, it starts in April. It goes for six months. He says, it's a great thing. You're, you're really going to love it. And I said, well, do you, you really kind of understand what I do? Well, uh, you know, you do like home watch or something, right? I said, yeah. I said, that means the snowbirds. And you know when they leave? They leave in April for, for six months. <laughs> Well, you know, you could always get the one-year contract. What, and have six months wasted? Yeah. Am I, and, and oh, by the way, what grocery store is it? Oh, he says, it's down there at Low End Charlie's. I said, well, you know, these are people who have multi-million dollar homes. I don't think that's where they shop. <laughs> well, you know, I bet some of them do. That's how they got so rich, you know. Yeah, and I said, I don't think you really understand my business at all. Well, but that's not important as much as this is going to get people knocking and calling me all the time. And I said, well, excuse me, I have to go shave my cat. Yeah. And and I that kind of ended the conversation. But this is what happens every day to, to new entrepreneurs and, and even to people who've been in business for years. Mm-hmm. Somebody walks in with, oh, my gosh, I can do the best Facebook ads you've ever seen. And the answer is, did you already look at my market? And right. what message are you conveying right. before we look at that medium? Yep. So, yep, definitely. I agree 100%. It's funny. When uh, I was working with a client recently who was, who was looking for a marketing plan, and, you know, she just wants a marketing plan. <laughs> I'm like, well, we're going to have to start from the basics so that you understand the concept of what the marketing is. It's not just some sort of stock plan that we throw together. We have to figure out what your business, what your practice looks like, and what marketing is actually going to be effective in your business. But, Mark, if you if you had the opportunity to go back, say, 10, 15 years, and you could tell yourself one thing, what do you think that one thing would be? I would go back to, you remember the uh, phrase I was just reading in an excellent book, it's called Made to Stick by Chip Heath and Dan Heath, fabulous book. And one of the things they talk about is when Bill Clinton was coming up for election and uh, the phrase, and, and you know, some of the real young people on this may not, may not remember, but the phrase was, it's the economy, stupid. And that phrase, essentially won the election because it was small, it was memorable, it was easy. Mm -hmm. For me, the equivalent of that is it's the marketing, stupid. (laughs) And and really, I know you're saying, Mark, that's all you talk about is marketing. And the answer is, I know, but the real thing is it it goes back. I can have the nicest computers, the prettiest store. Mm -hmm. I can have all that stuff. And if there's no stinking marketing, there's nobody knows I'm there. It's it's the, you know, it's the famous, the, the, and I deal with, sometimes I deal with engineers and I struggle with that. It's really tough. Engineers are very analytical, and so, you know, it's a story of the engineer who created the perfect mousetrap. I mean, it was beautiful. It was, uh, I mean, PETA even approved of it. It was easy to use. It was simple to empty. It was clean. It lasted a long time. It never broke. I mean, it was fabulous, and so the guy built three of them. Nobody ever heard from him again. And the reason is because nobody knew it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the guy built a perfect mousetrap but had zero marketing. Right. Right. No, and I'm positive that there are many, many, many other inventions and things of that sort out there that just don't have that that correct marketing 
aligned for their their idea, their practice, their business, whatever it is. Um, and unfortunately, they go unknown versus having the ability to share that story and that message. So um, the show. Well, you know. Mm-hmm. Lori, when I when I've worked with financial advisors, it's a, it's an excellent, uh, you know, an excellent example. Uh, I I sit down and I I, I write copy, and and what that means is that's persuasion and influence in writing. Mm-hmm. And so I write advertising and marketing copy, and when I sit down uh, with a number of these these people, they're just not getting their excellent business information out for others to choose them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it just makes it very much a challenge. And I, I'll give you one example. And, and if you've got any any people in the financial industry, listen, uh, one of my clients told me this, this was a $10,000 idea, and I'm going to give it to everybody for free right now. Mm-hmm. And it's so stinking simple, it's going to blow you away. But the vast vast majority of financial advisors are bringing in large sums of money from individuals or couples. So I asked this one individual, I said, okay, what is the minimum in order to be your client? And he said, we generally will go down to 800,000, but we generally use a million dollars is, is the minimum to invest in order to be my client. And I said, great. What do you do after they send you or give you the numbers or whatever is necessary, and you now have an additional million dollars in your portfolio? What do you do? Mm. And the question and, and the question just stumped him. <laughs> and, and, I, and he says, "Well, what do you mean? What do I do? Well, we manage it." And I said, "No, no, no, no. I mean, what do you do now that you somebody just gave you, you a million dollars?" Yes, exactly. And, and he. He confidently said, well, we send them a fruit basket. <laughs> and so just as an aside, just for anybody who ever does anything like that, make sure you have one sent to you so you know what it looks like. I asked him if he'd ever done that. He said, no. So I said, well, send one to me. And he did. And I'm going, this is what you get for a million bucks? Yeah. So so here is what I told him. And this is, this is he reported incredible results and said, I don't charge enough. And I, so to me, I'm going, oh, well, okay, I'll charge you more. But he was just so happy. And that is a personal, handwritten, no business card, no logo of your business. Thank you for trusting us with your future. We will treat your money as if it were our own. And that handwritten card from him being sent out that he signed, even though it's scratchily written because none of us are good at writing anymore, he said it is unbelievable the referrals now he gets, yeah. the reactions he gets, all because of that one simple little idea which I now gift to you and your clients. The, I thank you, Mark, and, and that's so funny that you say that. But follow-up, client retention, really making sure that you – uh, follow through with not just making the sale, but following through with making the relationship stick is extremely important. I love that piece that you gave to that advisor. That, um, I, I see that on a regular basis in the industry myself, working with advisors, the lack of, of follow-up, the lack of appreciation for those clients in a proper manner, in a way um, that's going to make that difference. Um, I love the handwritten cards. That's That's lovely, Mark. You've been absolutely outstanding. I appreciate the, the tips, the tricks, the ideas that you've been sharing. The show is really designed to help entrepreneurs come up with ideas to solve the pain in an industry that they may not have really been thinking of. And we'd love to help you, even though it is the marketing industry, and maybe it's not necessarily marketing that you might be thinking of in particular. But if you could change anything at all in your business right now, what would you change and why would you change it? The change I would make, everybody's going to laugh because they're going to say, wait a second, that's like the opposite of everything else. <laughs> but I would really like to change the attitude that everything has to be digital. I very much believe that analog is still in high demand, mm-hmm. and I have, have had a couple of my clients recently tell me that their research indicates that Generation Z, I guess is the latest. I don't know what we're going to do after Z. We're out of letters. But 
but the group that is following the millennials is in fact very much into a lot of analog. And the reason is because they find digital is great for helping, but they've now adapted to it. And the answer is, it's okay, and it helps me do what I do, but analog also plays a big part. There's a, there's a great book that I recently read called The Revenge of Analog. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the the guy's name is David Sachs, S-A-X. Uh, and it's a great story, and it's got, uh, I won't bore you with the contents of the book, other than to say that there's a significant analog kickback that's coming from all the digital. People are tired of, mm-hmm. you know, they want to hold a book. Right. They want to, they want to hold you know, they want to touch. They want to be involved with people. Definitely. And digital is eliminating so much of that that I'm convinced there is a huge niche for those who want to establish a relationship that is not digitally based. Mm-hmm. That, uh, in fact, a funny thing, you know, we mentioned the cards. Um, but anything like that, that is is truly a one-on-one. You know, there are people who use these pre-printed postcards, mm-hmm. and they think somebody getting it is going to go, oh, wow, this guy's going to think I sent this myself and it's handwritten. You know, well, maybe if they, they have a sight problem. Right, but, right. <laughs> you know, but everybody else is going to go right away. So, you know, this is, this is like getting an e-card. You know, this isn't anything mm-hmm. like getting a nice handwritten card from your aunt. Right. And loves you so much. Right. And so there is, there is, that is the change that I really um, am starting to implement. And that is, no, this needs to be a one-on-one type business. Because not only is that what it is, but more importantly, that's where the service is. No, I agree with you 100%. There's an enormous difference between the, the pre-printed card that I received from the insurance company that I'm not switching to versus, you know, the handwritten card from one of my daughter's friend's parents who just is explaining how the year was and so forth, you know, one of which is on my desk and the other one went in the shredder as soon as it came in the house. There's a huge difference when, when you have those pre-printed pieces that are kind of irrelevant versus something handwritten from someone. I have cards from clients, somebody does just handwritten thank yous from clients who appreciate what has been changed in their practice. It makes a difference and it's something that you really do pay attention to. Like you said, the the fact that everything is so digital nowadays, it's refreshing to actually be able to pick up a book and read it or to actually receive a piece of mail that isn't a bill. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. There's there's so much of that. Lumpy mail, lumpy yeah. mail still works. Snail mail Certainly still does. works. Certainly does. Yeah, Certainly does. and and yeah. and a personalized letter that's not a generic letter right. is is another example. And I mean, even if you're going to use a digital type format, nowadays you know we've got the data to be able to not send the same letter to everybody. You got it. Hello. So, no, Mark, you've been absolutely lovely. I really appreciate you joining us today and sharing all your tidbits of wisdom. I will be sure to link to absolutely every one of the books you mentioned, as well as um, to a quick graphic of the Golden Triangle from Dan Kennedy. I'll be sure to link over to that site as well. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, please share the best way for our listeners to find you. Well, you can email me at uh, Mark, M-A-R-K, at takecontrolmarketing.com, T-A-K-E, controlmarketing.com. Uh, and the other is, if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to send me a, uh, uh, you know, a connect message, and I, I'd be more than happy to do it. And the other thing is look for the uh, Tablet Marketing Academy. Uh, it's the weekly thing, and, and you can quit any time you you get promoted. Uh, don't need it anymore. Uh, but in the meantime, you'll learn all kinds of marketing tips and stuff like that. And there's, there's four or five of them out there. We're going to be doing it for at least a year. And that's another one. Just send it to mark at takecontrolmarketing.com and say, hey, put me on the list, and, and we'll do it. Awesome. That's mark at takecontrolmarketing.com. Dot com for all of our listeners out there who are interested. Again, we'll include links to all of this on the show notes page. Mark, thank you once again for joining us this afternoon. Techie community, be grateful.
that podcast players everywhere allow you to pause, rewind, and replay as much as necessary. So if you were driving, working out, or cooking while listening to this episode, set a reminder so you can come back with a paper and pen and grab every nugget that Mark just shared. And if you're ready to take control of your marketing, reach out to Mark at TakeControlMarketing.com. You can always reach him through our show notes page at technology-equality.com forward slash Mark Melling. I hope you all enjoyed and until our next episode, when we continue to hear the journey, find the pain and create solutions, enjoy the week.